Hello and welcome to the Superposition Guys podcast. My name is Yuval, and my guest today is Matt Johnson, CEO of QCWare. Matt and I talk about his advice for those starting quantum companies, how far quantum software is from being shrink-wrapped, what he learned over the past year, what QCWare will look like in 5 to 10 years, and much more. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, Matt, and thank you for joining me today. Yuval, it's, it's great to be here, and thanks a lot for having myself and QCWare on your program. It's my pleasure. So who are you and what do you do? My name is Matt Johnson. Uh, I am the, uh, a co-founder and CEO of QCWare, <clears throat> and what I do is <clears throat> help pull our team forward so that our business can be the first quantum computing software company that uh, can uh, yield a quant- practical quantum advantage. That, that is the objective of our company. I'm curious about your personal journey. You've been doing this for more than a year or two. How, how did you get into quantum and how long ago was it? Uh, well, I don't, I honestly, truly do not like to talk much about myself. I think our team is delivering all the value. Um, you've posed this question and I'll answer it briefly. Uh, but in a nutshell, <clears throat> um, I was uh, originally a, an officer in the military and I I was always enamored with aerospace and defense technology and just technology generally. And uh, after that, I had uh, gone into finance and specifically I spent uh, a decade or so in principal investing, private equity. And and those two professional experiences uh, were both fascinating and I wanted to somehow bring them together as a next chapter. And it seemed to me that um, working as part of a team to develop a business around a new technology. That, that's the com- kind of combined theme. I thought that would be very, very intriguing. And that took, um, that took me to Palo Alto about eight and a half years ago to work with uh, my fellow co-founders to set up QCWare, and uh, we've been going ever since. So that, that takes us to today. We're seeing uh, companies that were set up eight and a half weeks ago or eight and a half months ago. What advice do you have as CEO for someone who's starting a quantum computing company? That's a great question. For quantum computing, I think that that person should do a very thorough uh, mapping of the industry. That person should study uh, who is doing what across the technology stack and be very sober and realistic and honest with themselves about what what business prospect and technology they have that they really think is truly differentiated. And I think that exercise is more important today than it would have been five years ago when quantum computing companies and, and startups in general were getting money thrown at them. Now it is, um, we're, we're in a phase where, where all of us, all of us must deliver and will be measured as to uh, whether our thesis about how valuable our business is, comparing that thesis to reality. And, um, you know, you need to have a favorable conclusion or or outside stakeholders have to, uh, in order for you to attract employees and attract funding and to attract customers. So I think you should have a very sanguine view on this. It's an extremely crowded field right now. And there's tons of uncertainty around really the core kernel of what has to happen to the spark uh, to make this industry really take off as a commercially viable thing is having a quantum computer, having hardware that is capable of delivering quantum advantage um, using the extant quantum algorithms out there. So uh, absent someone coming up with an algorithm or a use case, that can leverage, uh, you know, 20 or 30 qubits and, and beat uh, any classical machine out there. Assuming that that doesn't happen, the world of quantum computing or, or enterprise computing really does need uh, a couple of hundred very, very high quality qubits, perhaps not error corrected, but, but high quality. So that, that's the spark that has to happen. Until that, until that is the case, all the other parts of the technology stack, like us as an application software vendor, um, we are kind of waiting for that to happen. And, um, uh, you know, and it, it requires a lot of resourcefulness in terms of, you know, building a business, a software business, when 
when quantum hardware is not there. What do you say to customers when they say, well, the hardware is not there? And I, I used to work for a software company, so I've been faced with the same questions. But what do you say? To, well, we have a couple of customer bases. So for customers who say uh, the hardware is not there yet, we, with them, uh, if, if they uh, engage with us, uh, it, it usually is because that customer has a view that quantum computing hardware will get there in the same way that machine learning and data analytics did get there uh, and it did impact their enterprises. So these, <clears throat> these companies, uh, these are very sophisticated Fortune 200 enterprises who um, are not just for quantum computing, but for any emerging technology are um, specking or investing small amounts of money to, to develop expertise in the technology and to figure out how it will fit into their compute workflows and how it might impact their business positively. And, uh, and so that's what we do. We're, we're really providing for them this uh, very technical um, partnership where we are looking at candidate use cases, so compute bottlenecks they have, and figuring out if and how quantum computing can resolve those compute bottlenecks. So allow them to, for high high value business problems, to allow them to solve them more quickly. And so, so really that's the gist of, of why a big enterprise today would, would hire QCWare. Quantum computing has gone through ebbs and flows. On one hand, the quantum computer is on the cover of time, but on the other hand, there's talk of quantum winter. Do you see that enterprises are less likely to engage uh, given what they read in the news? Um, well, that's a very explicit question. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that, I think that there is enough momentum in the development of quantum computing hardware and technology to convince these groups that, that quantum computing will come. But there's a lot of uncertainty around the timing and around the specific use cases that will be exploitable on quantum computers. And so I, I don't see that these, I don't see any of these enterprises backing away and saying, you know, we've concluded that there's nothing there. And so we're stopping investing, but they're moderating, they're moderating investment. And, um, <clears throat> and frankly, as, as they get more uh, information about where quantum computing hardware and algorithms are, that's, that's helping them have more focused programs and, and we're certainly seeing a lot of that. We're certainly seeing um, a coalescing of attention in, in financial services, for instance, around a couple of use cases and in drug discovery around a couple of use cases. So we're certainly, certainly seeing that. <clears throat> so, um, but that, that was a very explicit question you asked around quantum winter. And so that would be my answer, yeah. How do you differentiate yourself as a company? Um, my sense is that perhaps some years ago, there weren't that many software companies. A customer could come to you and say, hey, let's run some optimization on D-Wave, see how it works. Do you feel like these days you have to develop your own unique algorithms or provide value beyond we can help you get started with quantum computing? That's, that's, <clears throat> that's precisely correct. If you look at, I, I would say there, there could be up to 200 quantum computing software companies. 200 companies that attest to having <clears throat> some sort of product or, or product vision around quantum quantum computing. And um, <clears throat> so if you look at that, those are at, at sort of the, you know, really some, some companies are close to the bare metal and doing this, uh, this very kind of um, heavy duty sort of compilation and translation and um, error mitigation and all, all of this stuff that's kind of close to the hardware, close to physics. And then there's a number of middleware companies that are um, focused on um, optimizing um, mapping or embedding of problems onto hardware, um, making optimal use of, of the hardware resource that are there. There's, there's that level. And then there's a level on top of that, which is the application layer. And we happen to be one of the players there. I think we're certainly the largest by a substantial amount as measured by um, revenue um, and number of um, customers, both commercial and government. So we would differentiate ourselves 
by, um, frankly, our expertise at inventing and developing quantum algorithms that get baked into application software. In order to develop algorithms, quantum algorithms, um, it actually takes um, very deep expertise in in quantum algorithm design. And, and to do that, you need to have a firm grasp of quantum mechanics, of linear algebra. You have to have done quantum algorithm proofs, t- typically. Um, and so we've got a team of uh, close to 50 individuals. And of those, uh, around 40 of them are PhD plus in, in those fields. And so our differentiator, the reason people hire us is because they say, QCWare seems to be the group that is best at looking at a practical problem that we have, looking at the mathematical structure of that problem, and figuring out how to extend an existing quantum algorithm or to build a new algorithm to allow that problem to be resolved on quantum hardware. So that's that's really how we differentiate ourselves. People come to us because they're they're trying to answer the question, how do I get this problem runnable on quantum hardware? this real world problem. If you look at a spectrum of solution development, you could look at one end a completely custom job. Everything is very specific to every customer. And on the other end of the spectrum, you know, shrink wrapped software, right? I go to Google and I say, give me the best directions from Palo Alto to San Francisco. Where are we in quantum software along the, that spectrum? Right. If, uh, if you look at, at truly um, sort of bes- per- completely bespoke versus completely shrink wrapped or web web based for quantum software, I would say we're at kind of step step two or three of ten steps. So we're way over on the bespoke side <clears throat> still, and that applies to the entire industry. Um, and uh, I think part of part of that is um, obviously there there are only a specific subset of problems that um, appear to have speed up potential on, on quantum on quantum hardware. But even in that case, if you look at, uh, I'll give you an example to illuminate the answer that I have. If you look at, um, let's say, pricing derivatives, using Monte Carlo simulation to calibrate pricing models that, that are used um, by market makers or traders or investors to price securities, complex derivatives. Every one of those firms does it a little bit differently. Uh, so it's it's actually it's it's very difficult to have a um, a one size fits all kind of abstraction that that would satisfy all of those groups without any kind of customization. Um, and uh, and as hardware matures, as more and more banks and insurance companies and market makers get into this, yeah, there there will be that kind of standardization. But it's a it's an astute question that you've asked, and and the reality is, there is still a very heavy amount of this bespoke kind of work being done, at least at the application layer. I think it's different in middleware and kind of close to the hardware layer. Um. But yeah, that's that's my view. If so much is custom or bespoke, how do you see the company scaling? So in five or 10 years, do you see QCWare becoming sort of a Deloitte instead of 50 individuals, you're going to have 50,000 individuals or 5,000 doing bespoke work? Or do you see it moving towards the shrink wrap solution? Actually, yeah, it's certainly the latter. And, and we we started that rotation about a year ago. So this has all been part of kind of our master plan where we, we've done something kind of remarkable. We've signed over 50 customer contracts over the last three and a half years or so with, uh, with a number of Fortune 50s or Fortune 50, Fortune 100, Fortune 200 companies. This gave us insight into what products we should build, what software products we should build. And so what we're doing in, in the second quarter of this year we are launching uh, two products uh, that we will be announcing. I can't announce them yet, but they're in they're in two domains that uh, are that lend themselves to uh, being boosted eventually by quantum hardware. These products that we're launching are going to be on AWS, and they are 
uh, in both cases running on high performance classical hardware. So these are interim products that um, will allow quantum processing to be slotted into them. But until that quantum hardware is ready, we're going to be running on the very, the, the most powerful classical hardware that's out there. That's how we're making this transition. And in fact, I am, I'm from Minnesota originally, and uh, I and the rest of the leadership team, I think, all share the view that we want to have a very, very, very lean team, a very lean and mean team, and we want everyone on our team to be able to demonstrate true ROI. And, uh, and if you keep that kind of yardstick out there, you'll avoid, in many cases, the risk of overhiring. So, you know, oddly, when you think about it, if you have a, for, for, you know, in, in a perfect world, it kind of looks like this. For a SaaS company, a well-run SaaS company does about $1 million of revenue per full-time employee, a million per employee. So you could argue that if a company like QCWare with, let's say, 45 employees, which is, I think, at last count what we have, um, you could argue, well, if, if they're all focused at building and selling products, you should do, be able to do 45 million of revenue with that base. Now, of course, people say, no, no, you need a lot more customer success. You got you to build this. Up. You got to overinvest ahead of this. And uh, uh, in order to maybe that's true. But I want to see if I can prove and our leadership team can prove that you can run it a lot more leanly than that, that you can kind of scale profitably. Do you have a favorite quantum platform, hardware platform, and do customers come to you and say, well, this algorithm is great, but I'd like to see it run on IonQ and then compare it with IBM and then run it on Continuum and so on and so on? Or do you help them pick one and then run with it? We do not have a favorite platform, nor do our customers. Um, I think right now we, we are an, obviously an independent software vendor, and our job is to give our customers uh, the ability to to have their problems run to make them runnable their production size problems eventually runnable on on anyone's hardware so uh, i think it is really fair to say and this isn't a marketing statement we have very deep respect for every one of the teams that are building quantum computers these are these are brilliant teams brilliant individuals and um, they're taking a variety of different approaches there will be some number that will win and some number that will get kind of consolidated into the leaders and some that may just kind of, um, you know, not, not be operating five years from now. But um, we, we don't care to even try to, you know, pick a favorite or something. We're, we are just uh, hopeful that all of these hardware companies are going to continue to make advances. And we just want to be for our customers, that software company that is helping them squeeze the most power out of these early generation machines, more power than, than any other software company can do for them. That's really what we're up to. We spoke a lot about customers, and I'm curious if you could give me one or two specific customers that you're particularly proud of what you are able to do with them. Well, first of all, I, I would, you know, uh, our first couple of customers were uh, Airbus and BMW, uh, these, and these are, <clears throat> these have been very long dated, um, engagements for us. And I, I mentioned those in particular, I, I love all of our customers. Those two customers have been with us for a very long time, like coming up on, I don't know, four and a half, five years, something like that. And, um, we have deep respect for them. We, we really love the partnerships. And in both cases, we've, we've done a number of different use cases with them, building up quantum computing use cases that should be runnable with potentially significant speed up potential when, when the hardware gets there. So um, these, uh, these problems that we've run have been uh, ranged generally from machine learning and optimization. So I'd, I'd cite those as being... Um, very interesting customers. The other ones that we can mention are, uh, for instance, Roche, um, Boringer Ingelheim, uh, 
we have a, a number. I uh, don't know which ones I can disclose. <clears throat> I can also disclose our investors, and in some cases, they're also customers. So this will give you some more insight. Um, Goldman Sachs, we can disclose the customer. They're also an investor. Um, <clears throat> Citigroup, uh, Coke Industries, Samsung. These are all investors that I'm that I'm rattling off. Um, Covestro uh, is a customer and an investor. Uh, so I mean, just that—that's kind of a smattering. In in total, as I mentioned, we've signed fifty plus customer contracts, and I think we have uh, at last count something like thirty-two unique customers. So some some of those have been repeats. What do you know today that you didn't know a year ago? Or what has most surprised you over the past year as it relates to quantum? Uh, a deeper understanding and appreciation of the complexity of building hardware, quantum computing hardware. Um, it, it is truly, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, like in football, like a battle of inches. It's, a, it's an incrementalist uh, process. Um, there, there tend not to be any particular breakthroughs. It's just a lot of, uh, hard work. I, I didn't realize until a year, a year and a half or two years ago, really the extent of that. I, I just have developed a much deeper appreciation for it. There's a lot of quantum investment happening in Europe, a lot of government investment. Yeah. As a U.S. company, do you have a challenge, um, Going after some of that money, do you think that some of it is more limited to EU members, or do you think that you know the whole globe is open to you? I think it's uh, definitely very challenging. We've received um, a couple of very small uh, grants in Europe. Uh, I also think it's probably quite symmetric. Um, like I think uh, in the same way that. I think U.S. domiciled firms have an advantage to go after uh, U.S. government contracts, except basic research, where it's really global. I mean, the U.S. government on the basic research level wants to support uh, technology development everywhere. But when you get into applied research and kind of procurement, obviously being U.S. domiciled will help to get U.S. money. And it's the same way in the EU. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult uh, on that side. On the other hand, although you didn't ask this explicitly, And we have an office in Paris, and we, have, um, we are building up extremely strong relationships with our customers in Europe and with uh, you know, various government agencies and, and nonprofits. So um, you know, there are rules and practices and policies that we obviously have to and, and happily abide by. But we recognize as, as a U.S. company, um, being in other parts of the world, um, we are not always going to be in the pole position to receive favors from those national governments. And as we come closer to the end of our conversation, I wanted to ask you a hypothetical. If you could have dinner with one of the quantum greats, dead or alive, who would that be? One of the quantum greats? Uh, hmm. Well, I suppose it would be, this is a throwaway comment, everyone says this, I guess it would be Richard Feynman. I would like to, um, you know, discuss with him where the field is right now and whether he, back in 1982, when he published his seminal paper or uh, announced it, I think he published it in 81 and then briefed it in 82, um, if uh, things are developing in a way that he thought they would or what, uh, yeah, I, so I guess that would be the answer, yeah. And Yuval, I'd invite you to that dinner. Thank you very much. Matt, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been my pleasure, and you have a great day. Thanks very much.